Good morning. I'm uh, Dr. David Murray, uh, a heart fair transplant cardiologist who works primarily at the, at the VA. I have the honor this morning uh, to introduce Dr. Evan Klein, uh, my colleague and, and partner. Uh, Dr. Klein is going to give medical grand rounds on the title, The Medical Therapy of Heart Fair in 2022. I met Dr. Klein about four years ago when he came to our institution to interview for a position in our Advanced Heart Failure Transplant Fellowship. Um, he made quite the impression on, on myself, my colleagues, everyone thought the, the absolute world of, of Dr. Klein. And in fact, we ranked him number one on our match list. And he was a third year uh, cardiology fellow at the time at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Dr. Klein proceeded to do his advanced heart failure transplant fellowship at Christ Advocate in Chicago, affiliated with the University of Illinois. So what was that? Sorry. <laughs> um, but we had the great fortune of, of being able to recruit Dr. Klein af after his training. Um, and, and he's been an absolutely uh, wonderful uh, colleague. Uh, great to have him as, as part of our team here at UW. So give, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Evan Klein. Thank you, Dr. Murray, for that uh, warm introduction. Sorry about Advocate Christ, but it was a great training, um, as it is here for anyone who wants to do a heart failure fellowship here. So I'm giving a talk today. This has been kind of a, a, a labor of love, something I always thought of doing throughout most of my cardiology training. Um, and most of my heart failure training, as I heard about all of the evidence-based medicine behind medical therapy, and I said, at some point, I kept saying, at some point, I am going to sit down and do a deep dive into all of the data behind each of these therapies. And, sorry about that. Um, ultimately, grand rounds, I gave cardiology grand rounds last year, and that gave me the opportunity and the reason to do this. And um, fortunately, I get to share a version of that with you all today. I have no financial relationships to disclose. I'm just a poor junior faculty. So here are the objectives for this presentation. As a result of the presentations, participants will be able to identify the prevalence and severity of disease in the growing heart failure population. We'll be able to discuss the disease modifying impact of our currently available heart failure therapies. And we'll be able to develop an approach to how we can actively optimize the use of these therapies and therefore the outcomes of our heart failure patients. I really like the animation, so I put it twice. Here's our table of contents. Number one, we'll start with a little bit of the epidemiology of heart failure, as well as some of our current definitions for heart failure and how we categorize it. Number two, we'll go through heart failure with reduced ejection fraction with a focus on the data for the four key arms of therapy. That'll be your ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, and then your RNA categories, your beta blockers, your mineral or corticoid antagonists, and then your SGLT2 inhibitors. We'll then jump over to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, focusing on the trials in the three major arms. There's not a huge amount of data for beta blockers in that group. And then we'll go through some of the new subgroup analyses that focus on the heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction category. And we'll wrap up with a quick recap of where we are and some suggestions on where we can go to try and optimize the use of these drugs. So some key points to start before, or some key points before we get started. There are 6.2 million Americans with heart failure. One in five year mortality, at least in the mid 2010s, remains almost 11% and 40% for patients with this diagnosis. It is a highly fatal disease. Our four arms of therapy can markedly improve morbidity and mortality from this disease. But unfortunately, we are all significantly underutilizing these therapies. And most importantly for this audience, for sure, you do not need to be a cardiologist in order to use these drugs. These are mostly drugs we are all very familiar with prescribing. So here's heart failure incidence over time. You have the year on the axis down here and incidence per 1,000 person years. And you can see that over the last several years, many years, we've been able to slowly decrease the incidence of heart failure through our primary prevention strategies that everyone's employing. And we can see that that trend continued from 2013 Three, we jump to the early teens and we can see it kind of continues to decline. We are making headway. On top of that, we can see the comparison of one year mortality in the 1950s before we had any of these therapies for a patient diagnosed with heart failure was almost 30%. And the five year mortality was almost two thirds. We've made striking improvements in that over the last several decades. 
And here we can see from 2010 to 2020, we have survival on this axis and the year of diagnosis over here. The top line is one year survival. So we have more data on that. And then five year survival and 10 year survival. And we can see survival in all groups is improving. We are getting better. And here we have the inverse of that. We have one year mortality rates by age group and we can see they are coming down. We are making progress. Unfortunately, that comes with a consequence. The incidence is decreasing slightly. The survival is increasing markedly. We therefore have significantly increasing prevalence of this disease. It's going up near exponentially. And that's how we get to that number. The burden, current burden of heart failure in America is about 6.2 million Americans. And you can see that the majority of that is in the 60 and up population. If we look worldwide, it goes up by a factor of 10. About 64 million patients are living worldwide with the disease of heart failure. Some other interesting notes to make. If we look at what type of heart failure are we seeing on the inpatient and outpatient world, we can see that the rates of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction are decreasing slightly, while the rates of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which is predominantly driven by a lot of the comorbidities we see in our American population, is increasing. And so we can see that both in the outpatient realm as well as in the inpatient realm over here. So here's our recap of the epidemiology. Our current therapies are able to alter the natural history of this disease. We are increasing survival in these patients. As a result, we now have a lot more heart failure to treat. So wonderful timing. The uh, American College of Cardiology, the Heart Failure Society of America, um, they all came out with a new heart failure guideline several months ago. So we have the 2022 guidelines to go through. This is how they categorize heart failure. And this is pretty consistent to how it's been for a while. The first classification scheme I'll go through are the stages of heart failure. Stage A is patients at risk for heart failure. I jokingly say this is the entire American population. This is anyone with hypertension, obesity, someone with a family history of cardiac disease, known genetic family issues, someone with exposure to chemotherapy agents, anything that puts someone at risk for developing heart failure down the road. Stage B is pre-heart failure. This is that interesting patient we don't see too often who gets a screening echocardiogram and they have an EF of 30%, but when you talk to them, they say, I have absolutely no functional limitations. I have never required diuretics. I don't have heart failure. Stage C is what we see the majority of the time. This is symptomatic heart failure. And stage D is what Dr. Murray and I have the privilege to treat. And that's patients who have marked heart failure symptoms, limiting them even at rest, um, poor tolerance of GDMT, progressing symptoms, and potential need for advanced therapies and or palliative care. The next classification scheme we use here is heart failure with reduced, mid-range, and preserved ejection fraction. The definitions of these have varied a little bit over the years. These are what we've been using in the recent past, and this is what the new guidelines again endorse. An ejection fraction of less than 40% is classified as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Greater than 50% is preserved ejection fraction. And then we remain with this mid zone or this gray zone of mid range ejection fraction in between the two. And to make it more complicated, they extended their definitions a little bit to talk about what happens if the EF changes in response to therapies. We don't need to go through that in too much detail, but I will just point out they call it now heart failure with improved EF as opposed to recovered EF for patients who start reduced and end up improving their ejection fraction on medical therapy. These were our 2017 guidelines. This is what I trained learning. This is what was out for a long time. We're not gonna spend much time on it because we now have 2022 guidelines. So this is the recommendation for treatment of stage A heart failure, focusing primarily on management of your comorbidities. If you have hypertension, treat the hypertension. If you have diabetes, treat the diabetes. While you're at it, maybe consider using an SGLT2 inhibitor. We'll go through the data on why, but there's a lot of really good data for cardiovascular outcomes in that, with that drug. If they have known cardiovascular disease, manage the cardiovascular disease. If they're getting chemotherapy, manage that appropriately as well. We then progress through the disease spectrum. We get to stage B heart failure. Again, this is that patient who gets that ultrasound that shows a reduced ejection fraction or some other structural abnormality of the heart, but has no heart failure symptoms. And the treatment for this is a little bit more limited. We're gonna use just ACE inhibitors or beta blockers, maybe an angiotensin receptor blocker. We're not going to get into the rest of our medical therapy cohort yet. And then we get to our stage C heart failure. And you can see now the guidelines have really blossomed. There's a lot more data in this population. This is what's primarily studied. Again, we're not gonna focus on everything there. I'm gonna tell you to focus on these key points. So number one, our ACE inhibitors, angioretensin receptor blockers, or our ARNIs, 
our beta blockers, our mineral acorticoid antagonists, and our SGLT2 inhibitors. And of course, a lot of these patients are on diuretics. So now we have really clear guidelines on how to treat these drug, this condition. How are we doing? And unfortunately, not great. So this was done in 2018. This is the CHAMP HF registry. This was done on outpatients with heart failure. They had an ejection fraction of less than 40%. So this is the HEFREF population that has the most robust recommendations for guidelines. And they said, how many patients are on these drugs without a documented contraindication to therapy? And you can see in the ACE, ARB, RNE cohort, over a quarter of patients were off therapy without any documented contraindication. For the beta blockers, it was a third. And for the mineral acorticoid antagonist, it was two thirds of patients. And of course, at this point, the SGLT2 inhibitor data was not out. So all of them were off that therapy. And then they said, okay, well, if we go to the patients who were started on the drug, so this is only looking at the patients in the, gray, in the green bars from the slide before, how many of them get to target dose? Because target dose matters. And what we can see is that here in the red is the patients who do not get to target dose, despite the length of follow-up, which is about one to two years here. And so we rarely get them to target dose, even if we do start them on therapy. All right. That's the end of my epidemiology and definition section. We're gonna jump right into heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and go through the data. The first section will be on ACE, ARBs, ARNIs. And I'm just gonna take a moment on this first slide because we're gonna go pretty fast through all of this data to outline how this will all be laid out for you. So we'll start with the group of the drug up here on the top left, as well as the name of the trial following it. We'll have the number of patients included in the trial, the number in the treatment arm, and the number in the control arm. On the top right here, we will have the list of concurrent therapies that they are on, listing out our common other guideline-directed medical therapies so we can see whether the treatment effect is additive, meaning it doesn't matter if they were on a beta blocker, the ACE inhibitor adds something in addition, or if there's some sort of synergistic effect. And then we'll talk, down here, we'll have some of the key inclusion criteria, NYHA class, if there's an EF cutoff, if there's something that's worth pointing out. On the left side of the screen, I'll have one or two graphs outlining one of the key endpoints and outcomes over time. And here on the graph here, I'll have all of the kind of objective data on these four key endpoints. And it'll be some version of these four key endpoints for all of the trials that I say. Death or heart failure hospitalization, heart failure hospitalization, cardiovascular mortality, and all-cause mortality. And there'll be a lot of data on here, so I don't want to get lost in the weeds. I want us mostly to pay attention to the absolute risk reduction and the number needed to treat, because I think that's a very important number for us to pay attention to. I should actually talk about consensus. So consensus was the first big ACE inhibitor trial. This was done on just 250 patients in patients who had NYHA class four heart failure. And I know I didn't go the N through the NYHA classes, but these are patients who are symptomatic at rest. These are very advanced heart failure patients. They got included in this trial to say, hey, will afterload reduction with an ACE inhibitor help? Interestingly, about half of these patients were on, on mineral corticoid antagonists, even though the data wasn't out about that yet. And what we can see is even in this sickest cohort, the use of these drugs very rapidly over a period of just a few months led to a drastic difference in the outcomes of these patients. And we're looking here at cumulative mortality. This is all cause mortality over time. And we can see the numbers needed to treat are very, very low in this cohort just seven patients to save a life over a span of a year. We moved on to the next patients solved or the next trial, which was solved. So now we have a few more patients. There's some more data, the robustness behind this concept and idea. They broaden the inclusion criteria to anyone with heart failure, NYHA class one to four. This was what they used to define heart failure with reduced ejection fraction at the time. They include people with less than 35%. You can see here, the MRA is dropped off. That was a weird fluke in that really sick cohort. So no one's really on any significant degree of background therapy. And what we can see is looking at death or heart failure hospitalization and or total mortality, the curves are clearly separate. The numbers needed to treat, again, looking over here, are very low. To prevent at least one heart failure hospitalization over the follow-up of the four, three, four years here is only 10 patients. The numbers to prevent a death is only about 20 patients. Again, maybe this is a fluke. We only have a few trials. There were a number of trials that were done at that time. And here's a kind of a pooled cohort analysis of that initial data showing that this treatment effect is sustained with this drug class through all of these heart failure with reduced ejection fraction patients. One last thing I'll point out, and I apologize for not doing this earlier, down here in yellow, I tried to bold or highlight the date of the study so we can all kind of follow along the chronology and the evolution of these drugs. We moved on to ATLAS now. So now we, we know these drugs work. Does the dose matter? 
And so they try, compared here low dose lisinopril versus high dose lisinopril, about two and a half to five milligrams versus 32 to 35 milligrams. And what we can see is that the curves don't robustly separate, but they do appear to separate. And if we look at the primary outcome with death or heart failure hospitalization, which was primarily driven by heart failure hospitalization data, there was a pretty marked decrease in heart failure hospitalization. Notably, almost 100% of patients in this cohort on the low dose drug got admitted for heart failure during the follow-up. And so they had about a 22% absolute risk reduction, which is, which is huge, obviously. We then moved on to ARB data. So we said there are some people who don't tolerate ACE inhibitors. Is an ARB better than an ACE inhibitor? And the answer was clearly no. There is no difference in the ELITE 2 trial between an angiotensin receptor blocker, Losartan, and the ACE inhibitor, Captopril. But what about the patients who can't tolerate your ACE inhibitor? So this was a CHARM alternative trial. And we can see here patients who are intolerant to ACE inhibitor. And here's the rationale why. As we know, the vast majority of patients who don't tolerate ACE inhibitors, it's that persistent cough. The next most common one was hypotension. The one after that was renal dysfunction. If we took all of the patients who did not tolerate an ACE inhibitor for one of those reasons, and we started them on an angiotensin receptor blocker, the effect was preserved. So we did see a similar effect with ARBs as we saw with the ACE inhibitors, which was wonderful. Of note, there was a pretty significant discontinuation in this trial, but it happened in both the treatment and the placebo arms for what that's worth. Another thing to point out is now that we've moved through time, we're in 2003 here, we can look up at the concurrent therapies and we can see the use of some of these other therapies are starting to pick up as some of the other data is trickling in. We then jump to 2014. We're looking at the new Entresto drug, the ARNI that's out on the market. This is done in 2014. The beta blocker data is very robust. 93% of patients are on some dose of beta blocker. The MRA data is very robust. It's a little underutilized. So about half of the patients are on MRAs. And here we can see that in patients with reduced ejection fraction, NYHA 2 to 4, there was a significant reduction in all of their endpoints with the use of Entresto over the use of your ACE inhibitor. It is a superior therapy. We should be utilizing it. Here's my brief recap on ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and ARNIs, highlighting again the absolute risk reduction because I find that to be a very helpful standpoint and I have it highlighted for each of the common ones that we have here. And you can see the absolute risk reduction for these therapies are in the five to 7% range for the reduction of death or heart failure hospitalizations. It's very, very effective therapy. We then move on to beta blockers. The first beta blocker trial done in about 1996, this was studying carvedilol versus placebo. We can see in 1996, our ACE inhibitor data is robust. So 95% of the patients in the trial are on ACE inhibitor. No one's on really MRAs. Obviously no one else was on a beta blocker. And we are, here we can look at these NYHA class two to four patients. They get started on their beta blocker. Their survival rate is superior. Their probability of survival without hospitalization for cardiovascular disease is better. This is effective. The numbers needed to treat may be a little bit less than the ACE inhibitor by itself. But again, in addition to ACE inhibitors, if you treat 12 patients over this year, year and a half of therapy, you are going to prevent a death or heart failure hospitalization. Looking at bisoprolol, this is the next of our evidence-based beta blocker therapies. We can see a similar effect outcome. They didn't have a combined endpoint, so I had to leave that blank. Moving through kind of our trial data again, we look at the metoprolol succinate, the third of our evidence-based beta blocker therapies. And here we can see similar outcomes, the beta blocker class with these three drugs, very similar outcome data. We do tend to stick to just these three because that's the ones we have evidence on. The next trial, they said, well, what about the sicker patients? So if we kind of hearken back to that initial ACE inhibitor trial, those NYHA 3B, those NYHA 4, extremely symptomatic, very severe patients, EF less than 25%, there's no way they're going to tolerate a beta blocker with its initial negative inotropic hit. They're going to do terribly worse. It's not going to work, except it did. Survival significantly improved. Death or heart failure hospitalization improved. We should be using these drugs regardless of patient symptoms as long as they can tolerate it from their vitals. Looking at dosing, we can see the dosing effect of these beta blocker therapy. And we can see placebo, obviously much more event rate, the drugs work. But low to medium dose versus high dose carvedilol, we can see there's an improvement in outcomes. And you can see that in um, our first, which is our six month mortality data. We can see that in our number of hospitalizations, 
And then interestingly, we can see that in actually our ejection fraction on serial echoes, though a note is made, the effect is way more pronounced in our non-ischemic cardiomyopathies than our ischemic cardiomyopathies. The tissue is not dead, and so maybe it has a better chance to recover. So here's our recap on beta blockers and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. The absolute risk reduction for most of our endpoints ranges about three to 6%. And again, all of these trials for the most part were done in addition to ACE inhibitors. This is an additive effect. The next group we'll talk about is our mineral or corticoid antagonists. So again, same layout, data still in the same places, looking at the RAILS data on spironolactone versus placebo and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And what we can see here, most of these patients are on ACE inhibitors. The beta blocker data is still kind of cooking because we're only in 1999. But we can see in these NYHA class three or four patients with a reduced ejection fraction, there is a robust impact in heart failure hospitalization, in cardiovascular mortality, and in all-cause mortality with the use of this therapy. And the number needed to treat, very low. Over the span of these three years, if you treat 10 patients with these drugs, you're going to prolong or save a life. Looking at the emphasis trial, this looked at patients with a little less severe disease. So now we've tried to include the NYHA class two patients in here. Similarly, this is a plerinone, so an MRA versus placebo. At this point, we're in 2011, that beta blocker data is out. So we're up to 87% on a beta blocker plus the 90% on an ACE inhibitor. This impact, this effect is additive in addition to our other background therapies. And we can see, again, efficacy through all of our four endpoints. What about the new kid to the block, the SGLT2 inhibitors? This was kind of a really fun data set to, to work through. I did a presentation on this on fellowship, just going through the progression of how this drug hit market. Obviously, this was designed as a diabetes drug. And what they saw in some of their initial trials is that there was an impact on cardiovascular outcomes. And so the first heart study, cardiac study, was Empareg. And this had nothing to do with heart failure. They just looked at patients with ASCVD, any type of ASCVD. And so there was no NYHA cutoff. There was no EF cutoff. And this was empagliflozin versus placebo. And what we can see looking at those same endpoints we've been looking at is robust improvement. The graphs separate early and clearly and never cross. So they said this is obviously a very interesting thing to study more of. Here comes DAPA-HF. So now we're looking at heart failure patients. NYHA class two to four, LVEF less than 40%. Make a mental note, very few of these patients were class four. And here we can see robust data through all four endpoints. The curves separate. There is a little bit higher number needed to treat than we saw with the other four arms of therapy. But again, these patients are on pretty good therapy. 90 plus percent on an ACE inhibitor, Arbor Arnie, 90 plus percent on a beta blocker, and over almost three quarters are already on an MRA as well. This is an additive bonus impact. We did emperor reduced, similar patient population, NYHA two to four, reduced EF, very few with class four. Similarly on really good background therapies, um, the impact is similar. This is a class effect of this drug. So here's our recap on SGLT2 inhibitors. There is about a one to 3% reduction, absolute risk reduction in our cardiovascular endpoints we've talked about with this therapy in addition to the other three arms of therapy. I'm not going to touch on the other therapies we have for HEFREF as kind of laid out in that long diagram we showed at the beginning for the guidelines. We just don't have time, but here are some other thoughts that we could utilize. This is a busy slide. This is the recap of all the data we just talked about, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Again, highlighting absolute risk reductions for these therapies in each of these three major categories with our general classes of drugs and or our evidence-based therapies. And you can see, very robust data. This is making a huge impact in the patient outcomes as we saw over those last 20 years of epidemiologic data. We are beating this disease. One more time, just for good measure, these are the four key arms of heart failure therapy. Every single patient with an EF less than 40% should be on all four of these drugs unless they have a stark absolute contraindication. And just for fun, we talked about NYHA class four. If we get even more severe disease, if we have patients with a left ventricular assist device, the worst heart that they can possibly have, the data still says they do better on medical therapy. If you get them on all three arms, their survival is improved. These drugs work. All right. Now we're going to transition from me robustly saying these drugs work to a little bit more. These drugs maybe work. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Same outline, same layout of all of the slides. Charm preserved. These are patients who have an EF greater than 40%. We can see that these two curves 
while they don't cross, stay very close to each other. And we can see that our endpoints, our confidence interval is kind of sort of crossing one for all of them. It is unfortunately not making a huge impact. We look at herbistartin preserve, another angiotensin receptor blocker here. Unfortunately, we look at the curves, they overlap. The angiotensin receptor blockers do not have a huge impact on outcomes in heart failure with preserved DF. The ARB Arnie looking at Paragon saying, well, Entresto is better than just an ARB. Will this work? And here we say, still no. Maybe a trend for heart failure hospitalization. Our confidence interval only flirts with one, but still no. How about TopCat? Looking at spironolactone, the MRAs in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And if anyone's ever looked into this trial, we know this is a very flawed trial and we'll get into that in the next slide. But here we have really no impact except for maybe heart failure hospitalization. The curves don't separate great. Then came some really interesting post hoc analysis. They call this the top cat regional analysis. I have no idea why they thought to do this, but they did. And what they found was that if you separate out the Americas from the Eastern European countries who were included in this trial data, we start to see fairly robust difference in our outcomes. Our p-value is 0 0.026. Our absolute risk reduction is almost four or 5%. Maybe there is some impact of these drugs. So again, how can we explain this? I don't know for sure. This is very much post hoc data, but the authors who did this regional analysis suggested when they looked at it, the Eastern European blocks primarily relied on one heart failure hospitalization as the inclusion criteria for this study. While the Americas had a more balanced representation between that and a BNP cutoff, and so they said, I wonder if the BNP cutoff is what leads to that change in outcomes. And so they did yet another sub-analysis. And they said, what if we look at just the BNP criteria versus the prior heart failure hospitalization? And we can see in the patients who had that were included just because they had that one heart failure hospitalization, no effect. These numbers are identical. If we look at the patients who are included by BNP cutoff, we can see there's a pretty robust relative and absolute risk reduction across these groups and the numbers needed to treat are relatively low. Perhaps MRAs do help in patients with true HEFPEF with a BNP criteria. And just for fun, these are the BNP criteria they used, a BNP greater than 100 or an NT-BNP greater than 360. Post hoc data, but because of this, I do treat all of my HEFPEF patients with MRAs if I think they actually have the disease. Then came our golden child, the first trial to have robust evidence-based data for the treatment of HEFPEF. This was Emperor Preserve. This came out just last year in 2021. Patients with an EF greater than 40%, NYHA class two to four symptoms. They are on, interestingly, a lot of these other therapies because of their other comorbidities, not because of HEFPEF. But what we see here is heart failure hospitalization or death, mostly driven by heart failure hospitalization, a pretty significant endpoint. And there we can see, right, the cardiovascular death endpoint not really robust. Those curves are right on top of each other. But if we look at first hospitalization for heart failure, those curves separate and they separate very, very early. Hot off the presses, DAPA HF or Deliver HF, um, studying DAPA gliflozin versus placebo. Again, previously we saw that this was a class effect of the SGLT2 inhibitors. We continue to see that it is a class effect of these drugs. DAPA, DAPA gliflozin led to the same outcomes they met primary endpoint, primarily driven by heart failure hospitalization reduction in that group. So here come our 2022 guidelines. They're going to incorporate all of this data, but we're going to see a lot less green and a lot more class two indications. The highest of the indication is going to be the SGLT2 inhibitors. It's the only one that has a really good, robust data. And here are the, the, the verbiage that they use, and I'm just going to highlight the SGLT2 inhibitors because they met their primary endpoint may lead to a reduction in hospitalization or death. The other ones that they mention here, looking at mineral corticoid antagonists, mostly driven by heart failure hospitalization, consideration for maybe Arbor Arnie, heart failure hospitalization only, but very kind of weak data. All right, here come another group of subgroup analysis. And this was a fun series of papers that came out over about 2018 to 2020 that they called the across the spectrum studies. And so I applied that to kind of all the studies here that looked at it. And so they said, what if we take a look at all of the data, all of the trials that we have on beta blockers and heart failure patients, and we recategorize patients based on their EF. And they said, here are less than 20%, all cause mortality, cardiovascular death, heart failure hospitalization, they all meet endpoint. What about 20 to 25%? They all meet endpoint. 26 to 35, they all meet endpoint. 
up to 40%. They all meet endpoint. Beta blockers, around that 40 to 50%, we start to see some degree of loss of their efficacy. These drugs are better in reduced ejection pop fraction population. And we can see in the preserved ejection fraction, the greater than 50%, the beta blockers probably don't have much of a role. What about ARBs? I put all this data here so we can look at the confidence intervals again and see how they work in the reduced ejection fraction population. Here they have that mid-range, again, showing preserved efficacy through a lot of those mid-range patients. But I find the graphs to be most helpful. So that blue bar that you're seeing there is that 40 to 50% ejection fraction. You can see that the curves and the confidence intervals all stay below one through the mid-range ejection fraction. Use of ARB is effective in mid-range ejection fraction. What about ARNI? Again, very overwhelming slide, but we're gonna to go to the graph. Looking at the same concept, reanalysis of all of these patients based on the EF. And we can see again, they seem to have preserved efficacy of these drugs through at least 50%. And if we look here, just another way to look at the same graph, you can see that perhaps that efficacy holds on to about 55%. And now if we really wanna play with the data, that effect seems to be preserved even longer in the female population as opposed to the male population, with the effect maybe protected up until an EF of about 60 to 65%. What about mineral corticoid antagonists? Again, lots of data. Looking at them, you can see that seems to cross around 50 to 55% for at least our primary outcome, which as we talked about, was primarily driven by heart failure hospitalizations, not the mortality as much. SGLT2 inhibitors. Same thing. The mid-range ejection fraction population should be treated with the same exact drugs as our preserved, as our reduced ejection fraction. So recap of the across the spectrum data, which I personally love, we can see that the use of these therapies are preserved up until I hit these red boxes. And it's gonna flash there because interestingly, the SGLT2 data, its preserved effect lasts until about an EF of about 65%. So we can use this in patients who even have normal normality, while the other ones, probably around 50 to 55%, we start to see a loss of that efficacy. Guidelines for heart failure re with mid-range ejection fraction, very similar to a preserved, except you can see that they add, since they met primary endpoints here, a reduction in hospitalization and mortality through most of the recommendations. All right, all of the data. That was really quick, I'm sorry. So how are we doing? I'm gonna hearken back to CHAMP HF. A significant population of our patients who are eligible for heart failure reduced ejection fraction are not being treated with appropriately disease modifying therapies. And I can only imagine the HEF-PEF population utilization is worse. I don't have any data for that though. If so, do these patients reach goals? So in those green bars, the patients who are actually started on therapy, do they meet their efficacy? Do they get, get titrated? And as we talked about before, the answer is no. And that begs the question, why? So again, I'm having fun with my animations. Therapeutic inertia seems to be the biggest culprit here. This data also was kind of uh, post-analysis of that CHAMP-HF data. And what it shows us is here in red are patients who are on a stable dose of sub-target therapy. So not at target dose, but on it, and it never gets titrated through the 12 months of follow-up. In the green, they're on target dose, and it never gets titrated during follow-up. And then the yellow and blue are patients who do get some sort of dose adjustment, whether an increase, decrease, discontinuation, et cetera, through 12 months. And what we can see in all four classes, the issue is that we're not adjusting these therapies. They're not getting increased. They're not getting decreased. They're not getting stopped. They get started and they get parked. Therapeutic inertia. So can we get better? Of course, the answer is yes. We all like to practice evidence-based medicine, and we are going to continue using this data to improve our patient outcomes. So this was the Improve HF study done in 2010. And this said if an outpatient non-cardiology, or sorry, an outpatient cardiology group instituted a structured approach to try and encourage use of these drugs through clinical pathways, standardized encounter forms, checklists, pocket cards about drug dosing, if they did semi-annual meetings and said, here's your utilization of these therapies, does this lead to improved therapy? And the answer is yes it's not patients who are limiting the use of these drugs, it's us. And we're still getting better. So we're doing better at this. We can see 2013 to 2017, we are improving in all of our utilization, very markedly with the Arnie's, but that's because that's new data. So how do we keep getting better? What do we do to move forward? 
Here's the traditional approach to initiation of medical therapy for heart failure. We pick a drug, we start it. We wait a couple weeks, we either increase that dose or we add the next drug. We wait a couple weeks, we do the same. Every two weeks, we're talking to the patient, getting lab work, adjusting therapy. This is standard, this works well. This takes almost a year until a patient's on optimal therapy. Best case, maybe half a year. It's a long time. And as we talked about, therapeutic inertia being our enemy, there is a risk for therapeutic inertia at every step along this titration pathway. And let's talk back to the data. Time matters, right? These curves separate early and they stay separated. If we're waiting a year to get some of these patients on therapy, we are doing them a disservice. More granularly, the SGLT2 data, which is out, this is really fun. This met primary endpoint by 11 days of therapy. Starting these patients on therapy, sorry, day 12. Um, on therapy early has a huge impact for reduction, primarily in heart failure hospitalization across the board. This is amazing. This led Dr. Fonero and his group to put out two commentaries in early 2000, mid 2021 about what he called simultaneous or rapid initiation of medical therapy. And here you can see, he says on day one, start all of them, just start them all at low dose. I don't think many people are doing that. We'll show the next slide, which I think is a little bit more realistic about how to start the first four therapies um, within a quick period. And then he says, instead of waiting two weeks, titrate weekly, try and really get these drugs up as quickly as we can and as aggressively as we can. And I'll fully admit, I have not met this benchmark of weekly titration of drugs. I'm still a little bit towards that two weeks, especially with our beta blocker data. But this is out there, and I think it will probably gain traction over the coming years. Here's his, read his second one, which came out a little bit later, because I think he probably got a lot of pushback of saying, start all drugs on the same day. And so here, this is what we do for the most part inpatient. Start them within the first couple days. Start a little bit of ACE inhibitor. The next day, start some MRI. The next day, start some SGLT2 inhibitors. Once they're kind of euvolemic, get them on their beta blockers. And then the same thing he proposed before, titrate weekly, with the goal of getting them on target doses or maximal tolerated doses within about a month and a half to two months of therapy. Importantly, he said, focus on um, beta blocker titration. If we look back, think back to the data we talked about, right? The impact of dose was most prominent with the beta blockers as opposed to the ACE inhibitors or the MRAs. Um, and the SGLT2 inhibitors are kind of an on-off. There's only really one dose we use. Um, and the cumulative benefits are within a month. So let's get them on therapy quick. So here, what are some novel outpatient strategies we can use for our patients? So this is my personal approach. Every time I see a heart failure patient in the hospital, not in the hospital, it doesn't matter. The first question I ask, what can I optimize today? It's not what's their fluid status. It's not how are they feeling. In the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, is there one of these four drugs I can increase the dose of today? Or are they not on a therapy and can I start it today? If I go in thinking that, I always make some sort of titration. I'm fighting that therapeutic inertia. The next thing that a lot of places do is standardize your clinic's approach to medical therapy titration. This is very standard medications. We have, are all very familiar with their use. We can titrate them. This can be doctor-driven, nurse practitioner-driven, pharmacist-driven. I've even seen nurse-driven clinics. These are very easily, predictably done drugs. We can use telemedicine. I don't need to see the patient every time I adjust these therapies. Have your EMRs give you a cue or a flag saying, hey, did you think to increase lisinopril today? Have structured educational opportunities to learn about the impact of these drugs and to spread that information to the rest of your staff who's gonna be doing or involved in possible titration. Give pocket cards to providers talking about what are the initial doses? If I wanna start spironolactone, what do I start at? If I wanna start enalapril, what do I start at? Talk about the indications. When would you titrate? When would you not titrate? Have this very formatted for our patients or our providers. Provide patient education materials. I love this one. Empower your patients. If they know that these four drugs are going to prolong their life, they will ask you to make sure they stay on it. If someone wants to stop their drug because they get admitted for acute kidney injury, they're gonna say, hey, make sure you start me back on that drug. That's going to prolong my life. Give them the power to protect themselves. And then another one that I see less utilized, have semi-annual quality review. Have someone pull your data and say, here's your utilization of these drugs in this population. And that will give us all a kind of kick in the rear to hopefully improve. So I'm gonna end with a few things. I had this slide on my last one, but I made it more fancy because I played with animations. As my previous heart failure doctor, uh, program director used to say, Dr. Macaluso, he was a big Twitter guy, hashtag GDMT works, use it. And again, I played with animation. <laughs>
So a reminder of our key points. There are 6.2 million patients in America with heart failure that we can be treating. The one in five year mortality for this disease remains quite high. 11% of patients diagnosed with heart failure will be dead within a year and 40% of them will be dead within five years. We have the power to decrease that. Our current forearms of GDMT are, can markedly improve outcomes in these patients. We have very robust data to say that. And we are all unfortunately underutilizing these life prolonging therapies in our patients. And then the final point, like I said, for this group, certainly you do not need to be a cardiologist to increase Entresto to add spironolactone. We are all familiar with the use of these drugs and we can all make an impact. And I'll just leave this on as I start to answer questions with the HEFREF population, because that's where most of our beautiful robust data is, with the absolute risk reduction and the numbers needed to treat to prevent these outcomes. And we'll open it up to questions. Well, thank you, Evan, for an unbelievable, uh, comprehensive, excellent, superb talk on contemporary therapy and heart failure. Do we have any questions in the audience? Not we, yes. Um, so I'll, I'll display my age a little bit and say I, I, I wasn't around for the surprise of it. I kind of entered into the, the it's already established uh, a phase of that. But I, I think it makes sense to some effect for me. Um, this is primarily a stiffness issue. And so the, the negative, you know, heart rate slowing and uh, inotropic effect and upregulate your beta receptors doesn't seem to have as much of an impact when they're already squeezing normally. Yeah, Evan, we have a, a few questions online. Uh, first off, has anyone compared beta blockers to each other, for instance, carvedilol versus metoprolol? So there is not a ton of data on this. There was one good carvedilol versus metoprolol tartrate study, which I took out of the, uh, of the presentation because I thought we were getting a little heavy on slides. Um, that's the major one I'm known about. And what that showed was carvedilol was superior to metoprolol tartrate. Um, but again, we don't use metoprolol tartrate to treat heart failure with reduced ejection fraction too much at, in this era anyway. And then I'm not aware of any data with bisoprolol, carvedilol, or toprol XL, uh, metoprolol succinate, uh, where they're head to head comparison. Um, another question. In my non-VA clinics, I struggle with costs, particularly in outreach clinics where, where we deal with a lower socioeconomic class. How to get around this? What do I prioritize? What programs are out there? So that is a phenomenal and a sad question. Um, obviously, we wish everyone could be on all of these therapies. I find that for the most part, the ACE, ARBs, beta blockers, and MRAs are extremely affordable for most patients the SGLT2 inhibitors can still be very expensive and cost prohibitive. And then the utilization or the avail availability of the Entresto medication, I feel the cost is going down, but that can still sometimes be cost prohibitive depending on the patient's insurance. And so if they are not able to be on those drugs, I generally try and focus on ACE, ARB, beta blocker, and MRA. Another, another question, what is the uh, postulated mechanism for the effects of S SGLT2 inhibitors? Oh boy, that's a stumper. So mechanistically, we know that it leads to glucosuria. Um, why that leads to a mortality endpoint when no loop diuretic ever has, um, I don't know. It's not because of diabetes control. Do you have any in thought, uh, insight into that, Dr. Murray? Uh, well, I, I guess I can... Uh, expand that question a little bit with a question of my own. Um, do these agents, the SGLT2 inhibitors, have any role in patients with heart failure but without congestion? So in essence, are these agents working really as robust diuretics without upregulating neurohormones? Neuro 
So certainly the, the data is primarily in outpatients. So my hope would be yes, if we kind of flip back to it, this might take a moment. I'm sorry. Um, I'm not shared anymore. Okay, well, I can at least pull it up here. Um, we can see that the, oh boy, I did a lot of slides. Um, the SGLT2 data, sorry, included patients with NYHA class two symptoms. Um, and so most of those were not highly symptomatic, but the vast majority were on some degree of loop diuretics. All right, from Nicole Riley, uh, this, this was really a fantastic review of the literature. Can you comment on implementation of medication titration protocol by RNs in the non harfair general cardiology clinics? Is this standardized? Can it be? Do we have enough staff to implement this across the division? Um, I doubt that's standardized. Um, I don't have an outpatient clinic here at UW, but it certainly can be. Um, and there are a number of protocols that are available if you look for them for, you know, what drug to start first, what to titrate next, what barriers or what, you know, increasing creatinine or drop in blood pressure or when to hold. Um, so the data is out there and it certainly can be implemented as to whether we have the staffing to do so. Um, I don't know. I hope so. Um, we have a couple similar questions from uh, Steve Barzi and Elizabeth Chapman. Uh, what, what is the data for these patients, especially older, more frail adults? What percent cannot tolerate for drug therapy for HEFREF? And in particular, Elizabeth was focusing on the older age group greater than 75. So what, what were the average ages of the groups of the, of the patients that were included in these large scale clinical trials? So I think the, the average age groups in most of these clinical trials were probably more in the 60s. Um, when you get to the over 75 population, certainly over the 80 year old population, they, they of course did not have huge inclusion in the study data. Um, I find from my patient population, they tend to tolerate it similarly. Um, for better or worse, we all have a little bit more hesitance about the low blood pressure in that population. Um, but I, I seem like, it seems like they tolerate it pretty well to me. Uh, my understanding is that the SGLT2 inhibitors are avoided in patients with low kidney function. Is this because it is dangerous if low GFR or simply because it's less effectively administered uh, to site of action? What was the, which was the drug there? The SGLT2 inhibitors. So can I give it a try in a patient with poorly controlled heart failure and low kidney function? So that's actually probably the drug with the most data for low kidney function. So we can utilize SGLT2 inhibitors to a GFR of about 30. Um, and they, that population was included in the trial data. Um, so we really can utilize it through, you know, CKD4 and until they get really kind of more critically ill, start to get on dialysis, at which point the data kind of disappears. Um, I find that the low kidney function more often is a barrier to our MRA therapy um, because of the hyperkalemia associated with that. And also, of course, the ASAR Barney group, uh, group. So take that a little further. We often will introduce the, these therapies and the creatinine will go up a bit, either after ACE inhibitors, ARBs, Ar ARNIs, MRAs, and even the SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, when, when should we begin to become scared if, if we see the creatinine go up or or if we see it go up, do we immediately back off on these drugs or, or discontinue them? Yeah, I, I tend to allow about a 30%, 25 to 30% jump in the creatinine as kind of an expected effect of the therapies before I start to kind of back off. And that's mostly with the ASARB Arnie group uh, and a little bit with the MRAs. Certainly, I, I would be more surprised if I saw a, a creatinine jump with the SGLT2 inhibitors or the, the beta blockers, though. We do see a short term worsening of the creatinine followed by the long-term renal protective effects of the SGLT2 inhibitor group. I think, I think that's a real important point that with the SGLT2 inhibitors, you're often going to see an increased rise in creatinine early, but in the long run, it ends up helping to preserve renal function. We see the same with the ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and ARNIs. Yeah. 
uh, from Dr. Callender. Are there differences in responses uh, to these drug classes based on ethnicity or gender? So the most data I'm familiar with is kind of the ACE inhibitors and the ethnicity data, there really was not a significant difference that I'm aware of outside of the whole isodyl hydralazine um, trial data. With regards to gender, um, I wasn't aware of any huge difference, but if we, we reflect back on that slide I showed with the kind of HEF, HEF population and ARNI use, it does seem like there might be some different response. I'm not aware of any primary data supporting that though. Uh, you didn't address this in your talk, but uh, where does where does digoxin lie in, in terms of um, your your treat, treatment approach in of patients with heart failure? Um, Is this a bygone drug, or or are there certain cohorts of patients that still may benefit? Uh, so that's uh, that's funny. So in the talk I gave last year, I actually had up in those top four categories on the top right, I had the utilization of digoxin to show the change in digoxin use over time. I took that out of, of this one. Um, and what we see is the utilization of digoxin seems to have declined pretty significantly um, as the addition of these other therapies have come in. I personally don't ever really start digoxin for heart failure as just a drug for heart failure. I do, however, utilize it in some of our AFib patients with heart failure because I find it kind of serves a dual purpose there. Um, and there have been a number of DIG trials over the last decade or so um, some with positive effects, some with not meeting endpoints. Um, so the data is a little split. Are there any other questions? If not, well, thank you once again, um, Evan, for an absolutely outstanding grand rounds. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.